We're going to talk about militarism and education, K through 12, and then uh, Santiago and John are going to talk about militarization of university education, especially here in New York. Uh, I'll just do some brief introductions. Then Scott's going to talk about the dimensions of school militarism and the K through 12 system. I'll talk about resistance to that, what that looks like. Then John's going to speak, and Santiago as well. So I'll just do some quick introductions, uh, and then we can proceed. So Scott Harding is associate dean and associate professor of community organization at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work. He is co-author of Counter Recruitment and the Campaign to Demilitarize Public Schools, which will be published in September. Uh, I'm Seth Kirshner, uh, the other co-author of that book. Uh, I'm an independent writer and researcher. I've published uh, articles on school militarism and in these times, sojourners, rethinking schools, and other uh, outlets. John Lawrence, uh, psychology professor at the College of Staten Island, City University of New York, and a uh, member of Professional Staff Congress Committee on Militarization of CUNY, as well as Peace Action Staten Island. And just a word about that uh, committee that both Santiago and John serve on. Uh, this committee has been meeting, this is uh, CUNY faculty, staff, retirees. They've been meeting since 2014 to discuss the militarization of CUNY through Army uh, ROTC. Uh, they've had several successes at that, as, uh, as they'll discuss. Finally, uh, Santiago Guilvanier uh, is a member of the uh, Professional Staff Congress Anti-Militarization Committee. He's also an Air Force veteran who served on active and reserve duty from 59 to 63. He's a graduate of the City College of New York and taught English and history for 41 years until his retirement several years ago. Um, so, without further ado, I'll hand it off to Scott. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to provide an overview of the research that Seth and I have done in our book. Um, famously promoted. Uh, it's called Counter Recruitment and the Campaign to Demilitarize Public Schools. And in the book, we examine how U.S. schools are increasingly steadily being militarized in different ways over the past 20 to 40 years, uh, which in part is marked by the increased presence of military recruiters who have a need to sign up 250,000 new recruits annually. Um, so there's this growing need by the military, which has emerged since the end of the draft in 1973, to market themselves to youth, um, and hence there's the growing integration of the military into public schools. And in trade publications like Recruiter Journal, the men and women who are tasked with supervising soldiers consistently point to high school students, especially 17-year-olds, as their quote-unquote target market. Um, and you may know that U.S. public schools are now required by law to allow military recruiters onto high school campuses. If they don't do that, they risk losing uh, valuable federal funding. So recruiters use this policy contained in the section of the No Child Left Behind Act as an excuse to, among other things, make weekly visits to schools, volunteer to coach sports and chaperone <coughs> school dances, all in a bid to what they refer to achieve what they refer to as, quote, total school integration and, quote, school ownership. Um, importantly, what Seth will talk about, this militarization of educational space has produced a grassroots resistance, the small but sophisticated counter-recruitment movement. In the book, we demonstrate how counter-recruitment activists use various tactics across the United States to roll back this militarizing process school by school, town by town. Um, we've been involved in this research for the past four years. The book is based on approximately 75 interviews with activists and organizers in 25 communities, 15 different states. Um, so I just briefly want to highlight some of the dimensions of public school militarism. And again, this is a very cursory overview. Um, but these combine to provide the military increased and often unfettered access primarily to high school students in the United States. So I'm going to talk about the three T's that the military engages in, talking, training, and testing. In terms of talking, um, military recruiters make visits and classroom presentations in schools across the country, and this is um, 
in many cases a normal process. Uh, it's worth noting that the Pentagon's high school recruiting efforts used to rely on tabling. Recruiters would simply come to a school, they would recruit from behind the table, filled with brochures, displays, and a lot of free merchandise. But that's changed. Um, after surveying the field in his first six months on the job as Deputy Commanding General for Army Recruiting, Brigadier General Brian Roberts advised recruiters under his command that, quote, the best high school programs don't include table setups, they are passe. Instead, the top recruiters are now actually in the classroom, sometimes teaching, giving presentations at school career days and other career fairs, liaising, liaising with their school's JROTC units, volunteering to coach sports and other activities that get them into schools on a weekly, if not more, even more frequent basis. In terms of training, I think the most well-known example is JROTC, Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps. We're going to hear some more about that at the college level, ROTC. But currently, there are approximately 3,500 JROTC units uh, or there are JROTC units in 3,500 schools across the United States. About half of these are run by the Army. They enroll approximately 500,000 students. JROTC, as you may know, is a school-based military training program. Um, students who are enrolled in JROTC, who are oftentimes referred to as cadets, learn from uniformed military instructors. They study from so-called military science textbooks developed by the military, which are oftentimes exempt from the scrutiny given to other public school textbooks. And while supporters of JROTC claim the program is more concerned with inculcating um, citizenship skills and with recruiting, about half of the actual JROTC program consists of military drill and marching, etc. Students typically wear uniforms that are purchased by the military branch sponsoring their unit, and the Pentagon oftentimes covers some of the salary of instructors. Um, so it's important to think about the way this is uh, framed. The military, the Pentagon, and indeed many JROTC instructors claim that JROTC is a leadership and citizenship training initiative. It's not a recruiting tool. And the Pentagon has actually been out in front of promoting JROTC both as a source of enrichment for economically disadvantaged youth who are oftentimes targeted and as a way of boosting academic achievement and preventing dropout among so-called at-risk students. But if you look at the research, most of it demonstrates there are few, if any, significant differences in terms of academic achievement, high school graduation, or transition to college between those who do and do not enroll JROTC. Um, so how is this possible? In part, um, JROTC wouldn't be as pervasive in school if there wasn't support from educators and school officials. So we see this increasing education military nexus where there are different types of displays for the military. Just to give you one example, um, in Detroit public schools, multiple schools have principals and guidance counselors who once a week or once a month will wear camouflage or uniforms out of solidarity during school hours out of solidarity with JROTC instructors. Um, now, importantly, we recognize that students oftentimes enroll on their own in JROTC for a number of reasons. Some have a genuine interest in going into the military. Some have a family with a history of support for enrollment in the military. So some actually want that experience. And it's also true that some students gain benefits from the structure, the discipline, if you will, the authority of the military. Some gain from the networking skills and accrue social capital by being exposed to uh, this aspect of uh, school life, if you will. Um, and what about the military here? I think Barbara or JROTC can talk about this in the question and answer, but um, there are are not only JROTC units that are trying to be implemented here, but there's also this new form of military school, middle school and military training programs. So the military is also targeting ways to get into middle school before um, these high school JROTC units. There's approximately 100 of these middle school military training programs in the U.S. and I believe a new one recently was opened up in Brooklyn. 
Um, it's important to think about some of the reasons that JROTC promotes itself and how they frame the benefits that uh, come from being a JROTC, and then to think about what is some research show. So I mentioned earlier that there's not a lot of support for the idea that students benefit. In fact, a study at UCLA found that in Los Angeles County, the largest school district in the country, or second largest school district in the country, in LA County high schools with JROTC, those were schools that were also less likely to offer college preparatory courses, so we oftentimes see this trade-off where scarce resources are being funneled into JROTC instead of other things that might help a majority of students. The study also found that most JROTC units were open, overwhelmingly located in schools with a high proportion of either low-income students or students of color. Um, finally, in terms of testing, uh, you may be familiar with the ASVAB. This is an annual aptitude test that's given to some high school students. The military will offer, often offer this free um, to some high schools. Um, it's been designed by the military. It's based on the Armed Forces Qualifying Exam, used basically as a way to determine what are the best occupational tracks for potential enlistees. So what the military does is when they get access to ASVAB test scores, they can tailor their recruiting to certain students who look like they may be more likely to not go to college, may be more likely to go to a trade school, if you will, or to learn some vocation, and try to pitch the military as a way to get those same benefits. Um, because of some of the activities of people involved in counter-recruitment, the number of students taking the test has decreased, but there were still nearly 700,000 students who took the test in 2012-2013. It's also prevalent in certain areas. So for example, if you look in upstate and rural parts of New York, you see that many schools are still administering the ASVAB, which suggests that it's used as a cheap substitute versus other career guidance resources, although there's clearly a need for more research on this topic. Um, let me just close by saying that uh, throughout our research, and indeed research done by some others who are looking in particular at the role of the military and the militarization of educational space, the idea of uh, targeting, which is linked to the poverty draft, certainly emerges. Now, um, in short, it appears that many of the aspects of militarism in educational settings have a disproportionate impact on low-income youth on youth of color. I mentioned the um, study by UCLA. Uh, the idea that the draft, that we have a poverty draft through, um, through the volunteer, volunteering for the military is something that's contested, but the research that does exist is rather compelling. So one study by McGlynn and Montforti showed, much like the UCLA study, that schools with more economically disadvantaged students have more contact with military recruiters. So in other words, recruiters are more heavily represented at schools that are in urban settings, schools where there's a higher percentage of low-income youth, where there's more students of color. Recruiters typically visit colleges much less than they visit high-priority high schools, although as you're going to hear, recruiters do find ways to target college-age youth. And I'll just give you one example from uh, some information we got through a Freedom of Information request in terms of military recruiting in Connecticut in the Hartford area. Uh, Bloomfield High School and Avon High School. Bloomfield High School is located just outside the city of Hartford. It's a school that is a uh, high percentage majority African American, a lot of uh, low income students. Avon High School is located about 10, 15 miles away. It's largely white, uh, high socioeconomic status. Um, Bloomfield High School, the school in the low SES area, had recruiters come in one year four times as many, made four times as many visits as they did to Bloomfield High School. So um, I know that's anecdotal, but there is uh, a lot of other research that shows the ways in which the military is specifically honing in and inner cities, urban areas, uh, with their recruiting aspects. Um, I think it's also worth noting briefly some of the differences between militarism at universities and K-12 through schools and some of the similarities. Uh, so the degree of militarization, the frequency of visits is much more intensive at high schools. There's a greater emphasis on trying to get youth when they're 16, 17, and 18, when they're maybe more likely 
um, to make a decision to enter the military. Um, and uh, in terms of some similarities, the structures of militarism at university and high schools oftentimes work in combination. So we've seen examples where senior ROTC students in colleges will actually be mentoring JROTC units in high schools and try and make that connection from high school to college. Um, and there's certainly examples where recruiters are urging teachers, administrators, guidance counselors to get students thinking about scholarships to ROTC and college as early as middle school. So let me stop there and have Seth talk about the flip side of this militarization. Okay, Scott. Um, so as, as Scott mentioned at the outset, uh, part of our um, larger research project, you know, is the resistance to school militarism in the form of counter-recruitment. Um, and on this note, I just want to sort of recognize the presence here of Granny Peace Brigade, <laughs> Barbara Harris, and her friends. They've done so much in the five boroughs to, to resist what Scott has just been describing. So uh, everyone should take a moment to talk with, with Barbara and her friends afterwards. Um, so, um, so my job now is just to show you all how activists uh, are exploiting the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities, the chinks in the armor in the system that Scott just described. Um, so I'll start by running through some of the key findings uh, from our research, which is, again, has involved interviews with over 70 activists from 20 different parts of the country. Uh, after running through the key findings, I'll focus on describing in more detail two approaches to kind of improvement, two of the more compelling approaches. There are four in all that we identify, the other two we, we discuss at length in the book. And then I'll close by evaluating the impact that the kind of improvement movement has had. Like what has it achieved? What has it accomplished? And what can it do in the future? Um, so, Start with some of these findings. I'll just run through real, real quickly. Um, so, first one that, that we wanted to note is that despite the small size and financial hardship of many kind of recruitment groups, keep in mind there are around 60 grassroots, group, grassroots groups across the country. Some of them are supported by bigger organizations like American Friends Service Committee, but the large majority of activists are not getting paid for the work of any of those volunteers. So despite their small size and financial handicap, counter recruits have scored a number of <coughs> notable successes, including in, uh, in big school districts like in New York. Uh, and given the enormous power and resources the Pentagon has invested to market itself to children, the combination of legislation and patriotism that's, that's employed to prop up the system that Scott described to record any progress against these forces is pretty remarkable. Uh, another one of our key findings, and just, just to make a quick note, I'm going to go into detail about some of those successes are at the end of my talk. Um, so another one of our, of our key findings is that recruiters themselves in the Pentagon uh, have responded in ways that suggest that kind of recruiters are making a difference. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, over the past 10 years, bodies such as the Marine Corps University, Army War College, they have produced hundreds of pages analyzing uh, counter-recruitment victories, especially uh, in the military testing arena, and talking about, talking amongst themselves, uh, about how to limit the impact that counter-recruiters have had. Right, this is a small grassroots group that is apparently making a big impact. And in these reports, recruiters and uh, military officials describe counter-recruiters as adversaries. Uh, military recruiters' greatest obstacle, and you'll love this one, civilian organizational inhibitors. <laughs> so counter recruiters are having a difference, are making a difference. Um, however, we note a few uh, weaknesses. We make, we make a few critiques uh, included. Uh, among those critiques are that few counter recruiters are effectively organizing across racial and class difference. Uh, the movement is still largely white, and they're trying to do something about the racial and class dynamics that, that are involved with military recruitment. That's a problem. Um, uh, it's a problem with the movement that needs to become more diverse. Uh, one study from a sociologist at the University of Oregon uh, found that 
while 71% of counter recruiters were uh, activists of color, 71% of those recognize that uh, the racial injustice of military recruitment is a significant piece uh, to their activism, whereas no white counter recruiters uh, saw it as a significant piece of their activism. So there's a disparity there, um, and that needs to be addressed. Uh, similarly, there has been uh, an uneven level of outreach to non-peace oriented groups. So what we mean by that is counter recruiters in their campaigns, when they're trying to form coalitions and make, uh, make concrete policy change, they're not reaching out to, uh, so, uh, let's see, uh, they're not reaching out to labor. So teachers' unions are almost entirely ignored. And uh, that's bad because if you look at the history of counter-recruitment, some of the biggest wins came when counter-recruiters worked together with teachers' unions. And more recently, that has had a big effect in Los Angeles, by the way, something we, we get into in the book. Um, and again, this is kind of connected. One of our other key findings is that perhaps because of this limited outreach, a lot of activists feel isolated in their work. Um, someone told us that they feel like they're out here on an island, right? Because the larger progressive movement, these activists tell us, the larger progressive movement doesn't recognize recruiting, school recruiting, school militarism as an issue. They don't understand it. Uh, the larger progressive movement understands war and peace, and that, you know, when there's a U.S. military intervention abroad, they participate in mass mobilizations, they get out on the streets, but they don't see the long-term view. They don't see how war begins in the schools, as another activist put it. And so this, these feelings of isolation could be addressed if uh, activists work together to um, put together conferences, they could be teleconferences, they could be trainings in person, uh, this happened much more frequently during the Iraq war years. It hasn't happened much uh, of late. Um, last key finding I'll mention, the most promising feature of counter-recruitment activism is this youth empowerment, youth mentoring approach that we see uh, more and more groups engaging in. And what that involves, I'll give you some examples later, but basically it's adult activists working to mentor uh, youngsters, high school age students, so that those students understand the issues. Why are recruiters in schools? Why is there JROTC in schools? And so that those students themselves can work to demilitarize their schools. Uh, that will make the movement more sustainable in the long run, and it's also more effective because when policymakers see students getting involved, uh, it, it seems to make a difference. And, and that's, uh, that's something we stress a lot in the book. By the way, there is a, um, an article Scott and I wrote. There are a couple copies over on the table. You can, you can check it out later that address this, this aspect of it. Uh, what's the big picture? So before I get into some of the key approaches, the big picture here is we're, we're trying to think of and trying to encourage other people to think of counter-recruitment as a more viable uh, approach to dealing with war and militaries. That for too long, the, uh, the grassroots nature of war and militarism uh, has been ignored. The cultural piece, the public schools, the way that they've been militarized has been ignored. The left hasn't been minding its knitting. And the, uh, the traditional anti-war strategies of just getting out on the streets whenever the U.S. military intervenes, uh, that hasn't been as effective. Uh, better chances for more concrete change on this front through counter-recruitment. So that's kind of a big picture to keep in mind. Two key approaches to counter-recruitment. The first, some of you may be familiar with this already, it's what we call the consumer advocacy approach. Other actors like to think of it as truth in recruiting. And basically this is going into schools or working outside of schools to talk about uh, alternatives to the military for getting college aid, talking about and handing out literature regarding uh, the realities of military service in an effort to fill youth and parents in on the other side of the recruitment pitch. One study uh, uh, we, 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 we know of shows that recruiters, when they talk to students, and this was a study of over a thousand students, 
that showed that when your recruiters talk to students, 86% of the time, they're not telling students about the risks of military service. And we all know, right, this is a totally risk-free endeavor. So that's a problem. So part of this consumer advocacy approach is to fill in that other part of the recruitment pitch and to make sure that youth are fully informed about making this a very important life decision. Um, and uh, Barbara Harris with Grand Imperial here, here in the city, uh, she, they can talk more about this later, but one of the things that they're doing is uh, outside of parent-teacher nights, we go to different schools in the five boroughs on parent-teacher nights when there's a lot of parents coming in and they hand out literature. Uh, and uh, they, they made some very important contacts and connections with parents who are, con are as just, just as much concerned about um, uh, military recruiter contact with their with their children as the as these activists are. They're the big historians. They don't want their kids going. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that they appreciate the outreach that we all are yeah. you know, doing, and they appreciate this information. It's hard to find. Um, and uh, the youth empower empowerment approach, I uh, described that very briefly earlier. One example here in the city, the Youth Activist Youth Allies Network. Has anyone heard of them? Okay, you guys have. Um, they're still active. They're now working on different issues, but uh, in 2009, after a year-long effort led by youth, uh, we received a stipend, incidentally. They have some, some grant money to do this. Uh, these youth fanned out across the city. They educated their peers about military recruiting issues. They were supported by the New York Civil Liberties Union. Um, they reached out to key stakeholders. And in the end, 2009, Chancellor's regulation affecting all five boroughs, hundreds of thousands of students, passed it's essentially a policy sharply limiting the kinds of contact recruiters can have with youth, uh, assigning a military recruiter monitor to every school. Uh, so that was a significant uh, achievement on the youth empowerment front. And there are other groups that are doing this across the country. We can discuss more of that in the Q&A. But the idea here is to reach those youth who are directly affected by militarism. Um, the, youth, uh, the activists who are doing the youth empowerment track, they're not, they aren't that concerned about uh, getting students in the suburbs um, into counter-recruitment. They're really trying to reach those who are directly impacted, youth of color, low-income students, because they are seeing the recruiters more. But are they also looking for a student of a certain caliber? I don't sure. think they want any more than, you know, our alternatives to the military programs and want kids who can't make it on time. And yeah, I don't sure think the military that. wants them either. I think those kids are totally lost in the system. The unique thing about is, okay, thanks. The unique thing about the Yaya Network is that they really have a pretty robust system in place of educating students. Uh, on it, on community organizing principles. So they're really getting those those kids uh, trained in how to how to do this work, and uh, helping them be more reliable, and all that good stuff. So a lot of good things going on the youth empowerment front. So let me close by talking about the impact that the movements have. Um, it's first important to note that uh, these these uh, victories uh, are small scale. They come one school district at a time. It's incremental. Uh, there's a writer I like a lot, a lot of Raoul uh, He talks about how with activist victories, um, uh, successes are like fleeting insurrectionary moments where the unfeasible becomes visible, like lightning illuminating the night sky. And that I think really kind of captures the world of, of kind of recruitment. As so Scott, Scott described, the military is working overtime to really penetrate schools, 10% uh, of enlistments come from school-based military testing programs. 40% of students who take the ROTC enlist in some manner, reserve, active duty. Um, so counter-recruitment successes are small-scale. Just a couple of examples. Maryland in 2010 passes a statewide law uh, making sure that if you take the ASVAB, if you take that military test in schools, your privacy is protected. We aren't going to contact you. That came after a lot of organizing. Um, you can learn about more at studentprivacy.org. 2014, just last year, a similar campaign led by an Iraq War vet and a high school student uh, helped pass a similar law in New Hampshire. 
And that's very significant because in the mid 70s, this is immediately post draft. New Hampshire mandated that all high school students take the ASVAB, that they, they all take that military test. Uh, so it's quite a turnaround. Um, and uh, activists have also convinced large national associations like the American Public Health Association to take stands on military recruitment issues. The American Public Health Association in 2012 passed a resolution on this. And this resolution has been used by activists to get uh, further headway in their campaigns. Um, last thing I'll say is that, you know, in, in terms of concluding, we want to stress the importance of youth activism. Training youth activists is critical to this work. It makes it more sustainable. Uh, makes campaigns stick better. Makes them more effective. Um, and. Uh, I'll, I'll close by coming back to, to New York. Because one of the things we talk about in the book is the transformative impact of Cal Recruit. And I think that really comes out when you look at a before and after picture. We do that with several, with several cities in, in, in the last chapter of the book. What did New York look like before the Yaya's, before Granny Peace Brigade started doing their work in the schools? Well, you had the largest, largest school district in the country, so for recruiters, this is gold, right? Militarism used to be so normalized that 13% of high school students reported seeing recruiters in their schools every week. A third of students said that military personnel just went wherever they wanted in schools, right? And that changed, of course, completely after the 2009 Chancellor reg uh, regulation. So these concrete changes uh, can make a difference. And we feel like uh, left activists on the left need to really put more time and energy, more of the resources into this form of activism, which is ultimately, we feel, more effective than uh, what you'd call the traditional anti-war. Uh, What's the name of your book again? Counter-Recruitment and the Campaign to Demilitarize Public Schools. So there's... But I was telling you about this interaction she had with a man yesterday. The guy with the mobile vans. <laughs> Who published it? Well, maybe we could... Uh, All right, just to... Yeah, because I'd love to... Yeah. I know we have lots of uh, good comments, but Santiago, uh, Santiago and John are going to talk now about what's happening at the University of Rome. Okay. Uh, uh, briefly, there at the City University in New York, CUNY, there there have been uh, an effort to bring ROTC back, and so we were, we're organizing against that. Uh, Santiago is going to uh, give a brief overview of uh, how they sell ROTC at at CUNY and his experience in the military. And then I'm going to talk uh, more specifically about our campaign to try to stop it and some victories we've had and some uh, difficulties we've run into. So, Santiago. Um, yeah, still, good morning. Let me ask you a couple questions first because I'm a teacher, I may be retired, right? And I always, always like to know who the audience is. So, my first question to you is, have any of you served in the military? Good, okay. Would you share a little of that, please? Okay. It's pretty uneventful for me. Okay. And I was uh, one of the last draftees uh, during the Vietnam era, and uh, I served two years in Arizona at Fort Huachuca with the U.S. Army, where draftees went to the Army. And uh, because I had a, a science degree, actually a mathematics degree, at the time that I was drafted, um, I had effectively a desk job where I worked with mostly civilians and a couple of officers. It was a pretty top-heavy uh, rank area at Fort Huachuca. And um, so I was basically a mathematics statistician. Uh, for two years, and um, as I said, it's pretty uneventful. I get 72 to 74, so as right as the as the war was kind of uh, transitioning, and in fact, they ended the draft less than six months after I was drafted, and I had uh, made a proposal that they release everybody who had been drafted that had been there less than six months, so they wouldn't have to pay any GI benefits for anyone. 
they very graciously uh, said thank you, but uh, no. Actually, I, I had a selfish reason for making that proposal, but uh, nonetheless, that's that's pretty much my uh, my military career. Thank you, Nate. Ralph Hess. Thank you, Ralph. You're welcome. Anybody here know someone in the military? <coughs> okay. May I, please? Um, my son-in-law, and he was at Fort Machuca, Yuma, outside of Yuma, Arizona, right? Well, it's south of Tucson, actually. It's, it's, it's close to, the closest city is Nogales. Oh, okay. Well, he was, he was there. I mean, or Sierra Vista. Or but he never went anywhere. I mean, he never left stateside. Uh, but I've also had, I mean, I have uncles that was in World War II and were active duty and grew up, you know, knowing. I was telling somebody every Saturday I went with my grandmother to watch the newsreel to see if she could see any of her, her sons who were uh, in the military. And I also have friends who uh, Vietnam War and the Korean War. Okay. May I ask your name, please? Phyllis Cunningham. Thank you. And I lived with a Vietnam vet for six years, I guess, and we couldn't get past his being in Vietnam. Uh, what it took out of his, you know, it destroyed his life. It just destroyed him. Right. Your name? Chuck. Sure. Pleasure. Okay, the reason why I started on that note is essentially that four generations of my family, who are all Puerto Ricans, have served in the United States military beginning with a grand uncle, who was in the Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican National Guard because the sugarcane industry was dying. So they sent him and his unit in World War I to the Panama Canal to guard the canal. Makes sense, Spanish-speaking soldiers guard the canal in Panama. And then uh, World War II, my father and all my uncles, uh, my father and all my uncles were drafted. I have one uncle, my, uh, mother's brother, Jose, who volunteered for the Navy. He was in the Navy for two years, and then he was released on a medical discharge because he had had two destroyers shot out from under him in the North Atlantic, escorting convoys across to Great Britain. Uh, the man was never the same. In long-term consequences, he became an alcoholic. Functional, but you know, that's what happened. Uh, myself and all the cousins of my generation, and I had nine cousins at the time, males, were in the military. Uh, half of us were drafted, again, the other half volunteered. I joined the Air Force in 1959 for two compelling reasons. The first reason was, it was a draft, there's conscription. So I went to the draft board on Kingsbridge Road, and I asked this lady, yeah, I live in the Bronx, can't help that, um, and she said to me, Okay, you got to sign up when you're 18, you're like two months away, you know, when you're 18 you come back and you sign up. So I said, so what are my odds? She said, well, they're probably quitting about, let's say, 18, you're not going to college, you don't have any serious plans, you know, uh, they'll probably draft you in about a year. So I said, okay, fine. Then I went out to try to find work. First question I got was, what's your draft status? Why are we going to take you, train you with a job, and then when you're functional, we're gonna you know, you're gonna lose it, and you act it right out. So I said, I'm not going anywhere here. So I decided, very simply, to enlist in the Air Force. My parents were dead set against it. I served four years in the Air Force on active duty, two years in reserve. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, nothing really eventful in my life. Certainly nothing heroic, anything like that. My big concern began to turn when uh, we have a son, Alex. When Alex was going to high school, he was going to Townsend Harris out in Queens, he came home one day and he had this Marine Corps literature in his backpack. And a very nice Marine Corps camp, uh, compass, you know. And I said, what did you get? He, he said, well, you know, recruiters coming to the school every week. <laughs> so about Two weeks later, I get a call from a recruitment sergeant at home. He wasn't home yet. I get a call, and I asked him to identify himself, and he said, I'm staff sergeant, whatever, okay, United nice States Marine Corps. You'd like to talk to him about, about your son. He meets our profile, so I said, so 
I like me, what's the profile here? Where's the scholar? You know, he, he got a very good grade point index, they knew that. Uh, he's an athlete, yes, he is. You know, he plays soccer and tennis, okay, right. And we understand he has leadership qualities. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is, I'm, I'm making fun of this, but this is serious business. Uh, SAL, okay, they're still looking for that today. I went to the, the ROTC at City College, that's exactly how they they sold it to me, you know. It's like, uh, yeah, we're looking for a scholar, or an athlete, and that's what we're looking for, okay. So, I said to him, look, like, you need to understand this, all right? I wasn't military. I know the dark side as well as the side you're trying to push. I don't want you to talk to my son again. Do you understand that? Well, sir, you know, I don't know if I can do that. I said, okay, very simple. Give me your name, give me your rank, give me your serial number, give me your unit, and I want the name and rank of your commanding officer. That ended the conversation. Alex was never approached again, okay? Now, final point about family, then I'll get to the CCNY program. I went to the CCNY program because I have a nephew, Nathaniel, who lives in Michigan. He contacted me about two months ago. He said he was interested in going to engineering school, and he had heard from his high school ROTC, junior ROTC person that he could get a scholarship. Nathaniel right now is at odds with his parents, you know. Mm -hmm. 17, that kind of, okay. So was I, so I could be sympathetic. I said to him, does your mother know about this? He said, no. I said, first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna call mom to the phone now, and I have to talk to her. So I went to CCNY to get some information from the program firsthand, because Martina said to me, I, I really want you to get some information. You were in the service. Would you please do this and you know, try to give him the unvarnished truth, both sides positive and negative? And I said, okay, fine. So, you know, I'll do that. The good news is that after getting that information, getting it to him and talking to him several hours on the phone, he's decided not to pursue that option. So there's a second. There's a second victory. Thank you. Uh, give welcome. Nathaniel credit, not me. All I did was just bridge. I went to the City College More program because I am a graduate of City College. I was there in 1971 when ROTC was banned. Faculty said it both, the president turned around and said, oh, it's time for you to go. That was the same program that had graduated Colin Powell mm -hmm. wow. five years before. Wow. Okay? So the situation very simply is, I remember CCMY. They, they wagged the hall, they had the whole first floor. This is a huge place, this building. It's still there today. They had all these offices. You walk down the main office, battle flags, battle flags, rifles, everything else, you know, all the impressive. So I went there and I introduced myself. Um, I have a number of observations from that visit, essentially. The first is the way they sell the program is soft. It's not a hard sell. You know, they're not trying to pressure you into anything. First thing that the young man asked me was, were you in the military? And I said, yes, I was. So he kind of smiled, you know, it's like, yeah, okay. But I didn't tell you the other side of that, but I don't have any love for the military. There are two institutions in this country that I do not trust, my government and the military. <laughs> where? I, I mean, that's my stance. This, this is where I am, this is my position. Is where I don't trust them. It's that simple. That's my experience, I really don't. So I went down there and told them I was interested in getting this information. All of these people have been in the military. Interesting, they're all veterans, either of the Army or of the Marine Corps, okay? The officer who's in charge of the program is a lieutenant colonel. Very well spoken, articulate, poised. You know, you talk to these guys. This man, this, this counselor, took two hours with me. He explained the whole program from top to bottom. In those two hours, there was not one phrase, forget a sentence, but not one phrase about the negatives of military duty. It was all, look, you get money, okay? You get a free education, you know? So economic is one of the one of the major reasons why I think they get drawn into this. You get your college tuition paid, books. If you sign up for a, a four-year scholarship, you also get a stipend. And at the end, as the counselor told me, you got you have a job, so you don't have to worry about being unemployed. Some job, but you know, I mean that's that's my opinion. Okay? That's number one. Number two, the military is a is a very res 
expected. I, I enjoyed the way that he said that. Institution. So there's this whole appeal to pride, you know, and boy, you can really look great in a military uniform and so forth and so on. So they, so they do try to feed you know, people's uh, needs for attention and things like that. I think the second reason why students at CCNY join this program essentially is that CCNY is very large. Right now it has a total population of about 12,000, almost 13,000 students. You can very easily get lost there because it, it's a commuter school. You know, they do have some kind of housing arrangement. They're a minuscule, very small group of five. So this way at least you get to make friends. So you're 18, you're not making any friends. Join the ROTC, you got all your buddies there. The military work on a buddy system, okay? You never leave your buddy. That's very simple. They drill that into your head. Never leave your buddy. You're always working with somebody else. He gets in trouble, he, uh, you help him, vice versa. All right, next reason in terms of the way that they uh, sell this. I think what they, what they try to do is just present all the positives. So I went home and I talked to my wife, Alicia, who has three degrees in psychology and you know, she's got all these ideas or whatever. So I said to her, look, what do, you, what do you think is going on? And she said, well, it's, it's very persuasive. I mean, what's happening here essentially is they've done this, the homework. They know how to get into these people's minds and, and they climb it right in there. You know? So the program right now, to get to the point specifics, has a total of 108 cadets. 44 of them are on the signed contract. They are committed to receive a four-year scholarship. That means that at the end of that, if they, they could be dismissed, by the way, for lack of academic performance or whatever, they could be dismissed. But at the end of that, they are obligated to serve six to eight years. It depends. They have a choice. They can go into the active army. They can go into the National Guard. They can go into the Army Reserve. They have a choice. Okay. Uh, all of the people in that particular group it seems to me, and this is conjecture on my part, I have facts, but this primarily come from sciences, either engineering, architecture, computer science, that kind of thing. Okay. They are, and this I was told both by the commanding officer, very nice, very nice man, uh, graduate of West Point. Uh, he was impressed because I walked in and they have like a break room and I went right, right past and I acknowledged him, you know, Colonel, morning Colonel, and he, oh, okay. So somebody actually knows the difference in terms of rank. This, this is important. 1% of the eligible population of this country serves in the military. After the draft ended, 73, the all volunteer force, that's it. The majority of these people come from the south or the midwest. They come from rural towns or small towns. Upstate New York is a haven for these guys. Yes. They just love it. Okay? So, as both Seth and Scott pointed out, the selling point essentially is, hey, you know, the military is going to give you a career. It's going to help you in civilian life after. You just step right in and you're going to get to do this all for free. Nobody talks about casualty rates. So I looked into the matter. The fact of the matter is, if you look at Iraq and Afghanistan, the casualty, the casualty rates for enlisted people are approximately 45 to 50 percent. That's all sorts of wounds and whatever including death, killed him. For officers, it's about 10 to 15 percent. The reason for that is, if you're an effective officer, you're not leading the charge. This is not Hollywood. Forget this. This is not Audie Murphy and to hell and back. It's not the way it works. The officer's back there, you know, telling you to go forward. Okay. This, this, I mean, this is my experience. This is the way it worked anyway. So, they have those people, they're committed. So far, they've had three graduates in three years. They expect to have six this year, and next year, 18. So you're talking geometric, okay? It's building, it's building. The office is just like a military orderly room, but up to date, flat screen TVs, everything. They're very impressive, all right? They're all very cordial, they're articulate, they're brain. they just talk to you in very nice terms. They try to figure out you know, who you are and where you're going. Um, I think, my opinion, this lodging, the program at CCNY, is going to be, as my colleague Glenn Kissack said, a tough nut to crack. And this is my final point. The reason for it is, I think the ROTC gets a lot of support from the engineering and science faculty. There is no doubt 
in my mind, that the Department of Defense has some kind of defense contracting with those schools in city. Can I prove that? No! Okay, I can't prove that. But let's say it's idle speculation, and we'll let it go with that. The next point, essentially, is these faculty members are outspoken at the Faculty Senate, and, you know, they can sway a lot of people. Our perception, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but then Glenn, if you're there, is that a lot of the faculty, I would say at least 50%, are indifferent to this issue. They look at it essentially, so there's no draft, so what's the word? Okay? If somebody wants to sign up for the military, well, go ahead and do it. That's it. So, this final point is an example of their literature. You know? I mean, it, this, is, this is high class advertisement. Our son is a professional photographer, believe it or not. All right? And I asked him, take a look at this and tell me what it is. And he said, well, it's staged. They look, they're a camouflage, but it's staged. You know, you can see the light, he's coming from one angle, and the other, it's not natural sunlight. So I said, okay, fine. So put a price on one of these photos with the text on the bottom. He said, about forty-five to 50,000. That book has 80 pages. The military is sinking a huge amount of money into this. Why do they want people who are 18 to 20? That's the most easily impressed group. Gangs, and there's a military historian who was, also, who was also a professor of classics in California by the name of Victor Davis Hanson. He calls the ancient Greeks enlightened thugs. My opinion, you don't have to agree, this is what the ROTC creates, enlightened thugs. Because the final point is Samuel Huntington, who read, uh, wrote probably the best book on this, The Soldier in the State, said that the primary function of any military officer is the management of violence. Thank you. Thanks, uh, right, uh, So I'm going to give you a brief history of the struggle at CUNY and, and uh, the debating points that have been raised at CUNY. And, and then I'll talk about the current status of our, of our uh, struggle. So the protests in the 60s through the, through the 80s uh, shut down ROTC at CUNY. So as in 2012, there were no ROTC programs at CUNY. Uh, most of them all shut down uh, during the 60s and the 70s in, pro in the context of the protests against the Vietnam War. And then in the 80s, the program here at John Jay shut down in the context of protest against the discrimination against uh, uh, gay and lesbian uh, participants in, in the military. Um, <clears throat> in 2011, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And, and this basically opened up a call to increase uh, the number of ROTC programs, particularly in the Northeast and on the West Coast. Uh, so. As Santiago pointed out, most of all the programs are in the south, in the Midwest, and in rural rural areas. And, and uh, a big reason why the military wants to increase in the west coast and in big cities and in the northeast is to diversify the officer corps. Uh, in 2011, a, the American Enterprise Institute, a conservative think tank, wrote a uh, position paper called Underserved, a case study of ROTC in New York City. And the American Institute made no attempt to obscure its agenda. The plan is to put diversity of CUNY student body in the service of the US military, especially as the military engages, uh, engagements are increasingly in the Middle East and in the Global South. So the basic idea is, is uh, we want to be able to put a diverse face when we're interacting with the, with the different uh, nations around the world, we want you know some diversity and to look like they look, basically. Exact. And so this is a quote from that uh, American Inst Enterprise Institute uh, paper. The absence of ROTC units on urban campuses, especially in the Northeast, prevents the military from taking full advantage of their large, ethnically diverse populations. This is particularly true in the case of CUNY, the third largest public university system in the country. 
By passing on schools like CUNY, the ROTC is missing out on a great geogra on greater geographical diversity. It is also missing out on the huge potential recruiting pool. Nearly half of all college students in the New York City uh, attend CUNY. Those students are remarkably diverse. African Americans, whites, and Hispanic undergraduates each represent more than a quarter of the student body, and Asians make up, make up more than 15%. Of the of first time freshmen, 37% are born outside the U.S. mainland. By recruiting at CUNY, the ROTC would be targeting a student body in which, for which cultural competency is part of their daily life. Uh, um, so in 2013, uh, the CUNY announced that ROTC was going to be coming back and they had a plan to roll it out at four campuses, the City College, Megar Evers College, York College, and at uh, College of Staten Island. So at College of, I'm a professor at the College of Staten Island, at the time I was the chair of, our, of the psychology department. So our provost came to us and said, uh, you know, we're planning to bring ROTC back, back to the college, and, and isn't that a great thing? And he, and you know, he didn't expect he, he didn't really expect any opposition at all. So you know, when he said he asked, well, what do people think about that? And a number of us objected. He was literally surprised. You know, he thought that why would you want to deprive the students of this great opportunity? <laughs> and and uh, um, so they had kind of had a plan that they were just going to like roll it out and it was just going to be, you know, one of those things that, the, that, the, that they decided that this is going to happen. And we said, well, we want to have a campus discussion about this. And we also pointed out that any curriculum has to be approved by the faculty senate. And so uh, after months of kind of wrangling over the process of how are we going to debate this on, on campus? They agreed to have a town hall meeting. And we were able to get, uh, the town hall meeting was set up as kind of a debate in which there would be three people that are pro ROTC at, at CSI and, and three people that were uh, against it. And so on the against side, uh, we recruited two Iraq veterans and one student activist. And on the pro side, there was two administrators and uh, a representative of the, of the military. And so in particular, the Iraq veterans were particularly powerful, talking about their experience. And, and uh, to the surprise of the administration, not one faculty member got up during that talk and, and, and spoke out for ROTC. Uh, uh, it, there was some students that spoken for it, uh, the students were kind of more mixed, and they, and they saw it as an a financial opportunity. Um, so at CSI, uh, they in order to get it approved on campus, they had to uh, first get a department to sponsor the program, and so it had to be voted on at the department level, and then they had to get it voted on by the faculty senate. So they were unable to even get a department to, to sponsor it, so it just kind of withered away and died. So basically, the administration just stopped talking about it, and, and like three or four months later, we go, what's, what's going on with the ROTC? And they said, oh, we decided not to do that. So, uh, uh, and then uh, Medgar Evers, uh, they instituted the program without having any sort of faculty vote, and so the faculty and the student body there said, well, we want a, pr a process similar to CSI, and they had a town hall meeting, and again, at the town hall meeting, I think, Clinton, you were there, and most people against, came out against ROTC, and they had, they came to a vote in their faculty senate, and it was voted down. So, uh, uh, and it, from what I understand, this is before we got organized, both City College and York College had votes and the faculty senate voted overwhelmingly to support ROTC. So now there's, there's two programs at ROTC that, at, at York and City College that both started in 2013. And so we've been working to try to uh, stop, those, stop those programs. Uh, I briefly want to like discuss, well, what are, some of the, what are some of the arguments that were brought up at the two town halls that were for and against ROTC? And, and um, 
the arguments against ROTC, the, the first main argument is the U.S. military repeatedly engages in war crimes and crimes against humanity, and we don't want to ask our students to participate in that. Uh, so uh, according to the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal, quote, uh, war is essentially an evil thing. Its consequences are not confined to the uh, belligerent uh, states alone, uh, but affects the whole world. Uh, belligerent, sorry. It, it, it initiated, to initiate a war of aggression, therefore, is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, uh, differing only from other war crimes, and that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. So basically, according to the Nuremberg trials, that starting a war is the worst possible crime, humanitarian crime, it, that, that is possible. Uh, and the United States has a long history of instigating wars, in particularly and uh, participating in war crimes against uh, humanity, start, starting with the wars on the indigenous peoples here in the, United, in, in the Americas. Uh, since the Vietnam War, the United States has invaded Granada, Panama, Iraq twice, and Afghanistan. In none of these wars was the U.S. attacked first by the other country, nor did it face imminent attack nor did the U.S. exhaust diplomatic means to resolve the conflicts. Thus, the United States is responsible for, quote, the accumulated evil of the, of the whole in all these wars. Uh, in addition, since the 1960s, the U.S. has engaged in bombing, command operations, or proxy wars in Angola, Dominican Republic, Haiti, El Salvador, Guatemala, Indonesia, Iran, Laos, Libya, Nicaragua, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, and that's just to name a few. Uh, the, second, uh, the second main reason that was brought up to oppose ROTC and CUNYs is that U.S. government does a haphazard job of taking care of military, military personnel and veterans. So, uh, according to the Defense Department, at, at the end of 2013, uh, 6,773 U.S. personnel had died and 51,649 had, had been wounded in action in, in Iraq and Af in Af Afghanistan. Uh, the estimates of uh, Iraqi and Afghanistans who have been, uh, Afghanis who have been killed is ranges from about 200,000 to over a million people. Uh, 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 and e even if you accept that U.S. wars is a given, the U.S. military has a history of not taking care of its soldiers. A in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, the Army sent soldiers into combat with adequate, without adequately reinforced vehicles or personnel armor, causing many soldier deaths and casual casualties. So, for example, in 2006, a New York Times reported, quote, a secret Pentagon study has found that as many as 80% of Marines who have been killed in Iraq from wounds to their upper body could have survived if they had had extra body armor. Such armor ha has been available since 2003, but until recently the Pentagon has largely declined to supply it to the troops despite calls from the field of it for additional protection, according to military officials, end quote. Uh, during both wars, the, the military had a stop-loss program in which they uh, forced uh, military personnel to uh, continue to re-enlist, uh, having, having to go to mo multiple tours of duty. Um, oftentimes, military uh, soldiers and veterans received inferior medical, medical care and in some cases, wounded soldiers and veterans uh, have been systematically harassed by the military and the Veterans Administration. Uh, for example, in 2007, there was a scandal when it was exposed that soldiers were receiving poor uh, medical care at Walter Reed uh, Medical Center, uh, the National Flagship Hospital for the military. Uh, there has also been several investigative reports about the military uh, kicking people out of the, basically kicking people out of the military with uh, PTSD and uh, traumatic brain injuries with the goal of uh, preventing them from being able to access veterans resources uh, later on. 
Uh, uh, the military also has a long history of exposing soldiers to environmental toxins such as uh, Agent Orange and depleted uranium. Uh, <clears throat> the third reason that was kind of that was often brought up in the de debate was sexual harassment and sexual assault are epidemic in the U.S. military. Uh, in a recent study by the Department of Veterans Affairs, it was reported that among women deployed in either Iraq or Af Afghanistan, about a quarter of the sample reported being sexually assaulted and a half reported being sexually harassed. And this may, may underestimate the problem. Uh, another study suggests that 86% of sexual violence uh, in the military goes unreported. Uh, this is not only due to the fact that it's very difficult for women to hold men uh, who assault them in the military accountable, but it's also because women are often punished by the military for filing complaints. Uh, a, third, a fourth reason that was uh, brought up was the military puts our students at risk for a lifetime of physical and psychological problems. So there's been a, a, a number of studies on the epidemiology of health and mental health problems of returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. About 20% of those returning vets have diagnosable uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. About 19% uh, have uh, traumatic uh, brain injuries. Uh, people who uh, are in the military are at higher risk of suicide. Uh, higher risk of alcohol abuse. In one study, 39% of all Afghan and uh, of people that served in Af Af Afghanistan and Iraq uh, met criteria for alcohol abuse. Um, and, and military service is also cor correlated with uh, physical disabilities, divorce, spousal abuse, homelessness, and incarceration. Uh, a fifth issue is informed consent. Uh, informed consent with ROTC is practically impossible. Uh, the universities have strict criteria for ensuring that informed consent in research. Uh, informed consent implies a thorough discussion of not only the benefits, but also the risks associating uh, participating in the study. Uh, in regards to joining the Army, it uh, also implies that a person has a firm grasp of the history of the institution they are joining. Informed consent in the context of the ROTC is nearly impossible. Uh, the Army's uh, effort is to sell the Army. It's not to give people the, the pros and cons and let them make a rational decision. Um, six, uh, a number of people argue that it's just important for civil, civil, civilian institutions such as universities to be independent of the military. Uh, the U.S. military wields enormous power in the United States. Uh, over half of the discretionary budget of the, of the, U, of the U.S. Uh, federal budget goes to the military. Uh, it's quite important for civilian society, particularly universities, to be independent of the military. Uh, when the military becomes integrated into a civil society, it is a step towards developing an authoritarian militaristic society. Uh, moreover, we have a responsibility to teach students to be critical thinkers, and the military teaches people to deference to authority and, and a behavior that is antithetical to democratic discourse. Um, and the military still uh, discriminates against people based on sexual orientation. So people that are uh, transgendered can still no longer uh, join the military. In, in the history of fights against ROTs, the most common way that ROTC has been taken off campuses is the argument that uh, ROTC curriculum is not uh, rigorous and, and doesn't uh, uh, meet the, uh, basically meet the goals of the university to, to educate uh, students. And um, on the opposite side, the, the people that argued for ROT ROTC, they had uh, a couple main arguments. Their, their main argument was this is a real ben, you know, career opportunity for students. And, and uh, their second argument was 
uh, kind of odd. They basically argued that ROTC should be judged as, a, as an independent program, independent from the military. So we should, <laughs> we, we, so we should, we should look at ROTC as like being like a club on campus with all these possible benefits. And when, it, like, when, when they asked the, when we asked the, uh, the, uh, the officer who represented the ROTC on our panel to address uh, sexual assault, he said, you know, we have zero tolerance for, for sexual harassment and sexual assault in ROTC. But he totally ignored the fact that, that it's epidemic in the military. So, so there, his point was we should only look at ROTC as how, how is it, it has an effect on your campus and, and that it's, it's, it has nothing to do with the, the military. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, this is just my own edit editorializing, but as human societies, we have a great capacity to turn a blind eye to systematic injustice. And the history of the United States is replete with unjust travesties which have not that were, which were not only legal at the time, but also normal, woven into the fabric of our everyday life. Some of these include the genocide of the American indigenous population, slavery, indentured servitude, colonialism, child labor, sweatshops, and the disenfranchisement of people of uh, color, women, and, and gay people. Uh, and now, you know, for a lot of people, we look back on these institutions, we can see the, in the injustice of these institutions. And I think when people look back at our society, you know, in 100 years or 200 years, if we survive, uh, they're going to look at our hyper-militarization and ask, you know, why do we put up with that? Yeah. So, thank you. So, thank you for those remarks. I think... Uh yeah. Barbara Harris is, is going to be the moderating the Q&A. We're open for questions and the panelists, but we would hope you keep it to about two minutes since we don't have we have about a half an hour or a little less time. So I'll stack you. First question. I have two questions. One for Santiago. How, given your military history, how come your family didn't want you to um, join the military? I think that's my father in teen action in Okinawa. My uncle Jose had three invasion arrows, North Africa, Sicily, and Normandy. And they both said to me, don't. My uncle Jose was trapped. His position was overrun at the bulge. He survived by climbing into a pile of dead American soldier bodies and staying there three days. My father was in a heavy weapons platoon. He was a machine gunner. He said they didn't have enough ammunition to stop the Japanese who just kept coming. They had one night of salt on the beach. The bodies were stacked up 10 deep. So yeah, when I said, I'm, I'm going to go, they said, you're insane. I said, true, I'm 17, and I'm insane. <laughs> That's a good point. Does that answer? That was my first. The other question is, for, who is the publisher of your book? Uh, Paul Grave McMillan. Say it again. Paul Grave McMillan. We have some flyers. We can... OK. Because, and are you planning to, um, I, well, I guess you're going to go around town and publicize it a lot when it comes out. Yeah, so I think we're going to try to do that, I guess. BAI, of course. And, and one more thing, yes, John, in the terms of the injustice, looking back 100 years, or whatever, forward back, um, you should add the, dis, the um, disassembling de of, of higher education. Because yeah. I speak for a lot of adjuncts, of 35, you know, 13,000 adjuncts in the CUNY system, never mind 77% of courses, college courses being taught by adjuncts around the country, which is a corporatization and real problem. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, these are my concerns, not the, not the junior ROTC. Um, I was involved years ago with the Army Experience Center arrests in uh, Philadelphia, and whether we had any peace in closing that down, I don't know. It's possible. Um, Phyllis and I were talking to a man yesterday who was from Glen Cove. Glen Cove. And it seems the new thing the recruiters are doing is driving around in trucks with these same damn video games in the trucks, right? And luring the kids in that way. 
and, um, and, and we got to do something about them. We throw our bodies in front of trucks. Uh, but I think you know we, it just can't go untested. I mean, if you said that you got them out of the high schools and so far as having tables in the high schools. Right, what activists can do is they can ask for equal access. So recruiters have to come in because of the uh, requirement of the No Child Left Behind yeah, legislation. So what counter-recruiters can do is they can request equal access. Recruiters, military recruiters in there once a month, counter-recruiters have that right. They can say, we request just as much access. And that's not freely given. That's because of certain lawsuits in the 1980s that kind of recruiters were. They make with. it very difficult. They don't tell you when the uh, yes, career day right. is, you know? They, yeah, they make it with. very difficult. Uh, yeah. And so you well, they don't respond to you. And to you. on sure. days that Jay Rodzi's in the school, the military's all over the place wandering around on the day on Jay Rodzi. Yes. Yes. So you can't kick them out formally, but there have been numerous examples of limiting the actual presence to once a semester or once a year in some schools, um, as well as getting equal access. But it, it is limited in New York City because yeah. of the regulation. Right. But for us to get in, it's very difficult unless you have a friend in the school or someone who's an advocate. It's very rarely that we've gotten into career fair other places. But the trucks, I just want to answer that one. That's an old story. But we didn't have it so much in New York City, but at, up, upstate in other areas, mm -hmm. the video games and all <coughs> This is Long Island. Island. Yeah. yeah. Another question? Yes? Well, at Columbus High School in the Bronx, we have a friend who taught there. Um, some of the faculty insisted that uh, an anti-war veteran have equal time with the recruiter. And so even though the recruiter had to be allowed to come to the classroom, uh, this uh, member of the Veterans for Peace came. And they had, you know, they each talked for 10 minutes. He talked mostly about Vietnam. And uh, at the end, and then they had questions and answers. And at the very end, the teacher said, OK, I just, just want to show of hands how many of you would like thinking of joining. Not a single student raised their hand. It was a wipeout. And the, the recruiter actually complained. He said, it wasn't fair. You know, and I guess it wasn't fair because, you know, the, the Vietnam guy uh, knew what he was talking about. But you, you mentioned that uh, we've ignored uh, teacher unions, and I think we should correct that. Um, every two years, uh, there's a convention of the AFT, and about 3,000 delegates from all over the country come, you know, all 50 states. And some of us, have, we're delegates from our union. John, you're an elected delegate, and Marsha, so there's three of us going. And there's, uh, there's a Peace and Justice Caucus. It's not an electoral uh, caucus, it's an issues caucus. We've taken up the issue of Iraq. We brought uh, a resolution. Our union brought a resolution against the war in Iraq. It took years to get it passed, but finally, you know, it was passed when the war was going badly. And we did the same thing with Afghanistan. It took years to get it passed. Finally, it was passed. Um, but we could. We have a table, right? We could have this counter recruitment literature. We could sign people up from all the different states to do counter recruitment work. The fact is, is that most faculty are not active around this issue, and the reason they're not active is for the most part, I mean, some of them are true believers, right, that they believe in, you know, but not most. Most just believe there's not much you can do about it. You know, the recruiters come, what can I do? Uh, but to have an organized movement within the AFT, I mean, that to me seems so important. These people are so influential. They're in every classroom in the, in the country, right? So we have to, I think we should make a plan for the next convention, which is 2016 in Minneapolis, to, to do this uh, kind of recruitment. Yeah, I think that would be huge. Sepp alluded to, um, we talked about this a couple of times in the book, there were previous examples where teachers and unions were key in certain local organizing campaigns, limiting um, recruiter access, getting other kinds of uh, resolutions passed. So I think bringing something to AFP would be significant. You might think about looking at the resolution that the American Public Health Association passed as one component of something you could do, as well as thinking about accessing and trying to talk to educators nationwide and getting this issue just more generally on their radar. But the APHA passed this resolution at their national convention, and this is one of is a large public uh, association, the largest public health association. They basically made a public health argument against the presence of military recruiters in schools, arguing that this was, you know, they were basically preying on children, that 16, 17, 18-year-old high school students 
were not cognitively capable of making decisions about entering a profession that could uh, put their life and limb at jeopardy. So uh, we put you in touch with the two primary organizers of that campaign. It wasn't something they achieved uh, overnight, but you know they were successful. And I think that's another avenue to pursue. I just want to add one thing. Uh, the New York State United Teachers, I contacted them to sign on to uh, the ASPAB, eliminating the ASPAB, or having option A to ASPAB, which is a whole other story. And they um, only responded to me that I should speak with the board of directors. And you cannot get to a board of directors. I haven't had much luck with unions. Uh, in the city, in or in the state. It's and I support directors, you're saying? Yes. Well, we can. Our, our yeah, that's why I'm glad you're here. Um, because the NAACP has signed yeah, three on. Three directors, yeah. three members of our union yeah. uh, the board of directors of NICE. Okay, I will. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yes. Could I comment on this? Of course. Uh, I what, what I, I think, uh, as far as the power of our arguments, I think w that we have this won pretty easily. It seems that when we, when we have a chance to voice our uh, rationale for, for children not being exposed to all this military recruitment, uh, it's pretty compelling. And the fact that we're able to have you know, these successes was, was just a, you know, uh, a fraction of the resources the military is throwing at this is pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I live. I live in a town that's relatively small, uh, forty-one thousand, something like that. And so, I I have no um, concerns about being able to get access to the uh, board of uh, the school board yeah. getting into. Uh, counselors getting into job fairs uh, or career days, but what I would like to do, or someone from my group anyway could do that, what I'd like to know from you is where can I get um, a nice compilation of resources that have been used effectively so that when I go in, for instance, I go into a junior ROTC uh, class and I've got uh, Colonel so-and-so, uh, um, who's got him every day or every or three times a week? Uh, he's going to make his presentation, and then I'm going to go in and say, uh, "Here's the alternatives, and here's why." So I want to be able to do that confidently with uh, a complex. And this is it. That's it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is a national network opposing the militarization of youth. All right. It's kind of a mouthful, but it's a clearinghouse for information. Yes. So, Thank you. And afterward, you know, we can just talk to you briefly and give you some other suggestions. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I think one thing that you wouldn't find there but would be useful to you, uh, someone involved with the group in my neck of the woods, they will make available to you the letter that they used. But, you know, that would be great for you. So you want to have a letter handy saying, okay, here's why I should have access to the school to present these alternatives. All the language is there, citing the legal precedents, all on one page. So. Thank you. Okay, one more note. Uh, I forgot. We we have another group that the, our union, the Professional Staff Congress, is is affiliated with, and that's New York. I mean, uh, U.S. Labor Against the War, any war. And we have a table downstairs, and we have brochures on that table. Unfortunately, the, the organizers here scheduled their meeting at the same time as ours. <laughs> um, which is unfortunate, but I run a conference and I have compassion. And um, and so um, you pick up those brochures because labor is also a little tardy. And about, because at the point of, new, of US labor against the war, we have a New York chapter, and there are chapters around the country, is that, that the spending, the military spending can be converted you know, to other peaceful means, and even the military bases, and we have people who support that concept of taking some of the resources of the military and keeping them on the place, but doing different jobs than killing people. Better a roof than a, than a chest cavity, you know? Recently, in New York City, we've been working to end JROTC in the 18 high schools in New York. 
and taxpayers contribute $1.5 million to maintaining that, plus extras. And we've been meeting with city council members on this issue, and hopefully the chance is going to look at it a little bit. But it's a, you know, a speck on the wall to make a difference here. But what the grannies do is we reach out in the streets and uh, in trying in front of schools to get into schools has been very difficult, but we are going to make a greater effort and you've uh, stimulated us and energized us. Talk to parents parents to school. School. I've talked to parents associates. Whenever we talk to people, they are so grateful. They don't have the information. They don't even know about JROTC. When we do a phonathon in the streets and ask people to stop and think about this program and that kids have rifles in school when there's zero tolerance, that the teachers, the military uh, professionals in the school that are trained by the military are not uh, certified as New York City teachers. Um, we pay for it, and there's just the curriculum. There's no oversight of the curriculum, and as it pointed out, uh, it's military designed and it's uh, military based, and it's to win hearts and minds. But one of the things I recently read um, said is that they are going into the middle schools more because they feel that's the place to win their hearts and minds. They're so impressionable of uniforms and sports and doing push ups that they, they, they look at them as the perfect students when they get to the eighth grade to ninth grade to join JROTC. And indeed, most students join in the ninth and tenth grades, some in the eleventh. They have to get them earlier and earlier. Once they're in the eleventh, they've really been uh, brainwashed. Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, in addition to these actually existing JROTC-esque units that exist, right. there are about a hundred of them, Middle schools. In middle schools. Yeah. Um, there was a report that the Naval Postgraduate School did about nine or ten years ago, and that showed that up to a third of J. Rotz enlistments are due to middle school outreach. So, um, J. Rotz units, the cadets, you know, kids looking really sharp in uniform, older kids, yeah. they will go to the middle schools and pitch the program so that when those eighth graders move on the following year, they're all jazzed about military. Exactly. You know, there is five junior ROTC. Schools in Staten Island. I know. Most in any borough. It's a big one in Queens. And in Queens, that's uh, Francis biggest. Lewis. Yeah, it's it's one 600 of the biggest students. In the country. It, it is the biggest in the country. Yeah. They are so brainwashed that anything we argue or speak about, they march them out and counter every argument. Right, it's a big obstacle to organizing because yeah. the students in, like Francis Lewis, for example, yeah. that's not only the biggest in the, in the country, but They've won all these awards, yeah. um, mm -hmm. so they, the students take great pride in that unit, and the school takes great pride. And so to resist that kind of... They take great pride, but if you go on the, um, the JROTC websites in, at schools, you see their calendar, and it marks drill, drill training, drill competition. Drill is really what's emphasized. The uniforms and drill and the marching and precision, they love it. And perhaps it is the right thing to keep them in line, but there are other ways to manage this kind of uh, organization, teamwork kind of programs in the school. Yeah. Yeah, after yes. uh, after uh, some of the military marches where these kids march with the wooden, you know, guns and, and drill, I mean, we've had some occasions to talk with the students as they're going in to get drinks and everything after the parade. And I mean, some of them, I'm thinking particularly the ones from Francis Lewis that I talked to, <clears throat> that I talked with, they said no, they, they were not going into the military, but that they liked, they were going out of college, but that they did like J. Rotsey because of the support that they got all the while they were in school. Yeah. Uh, they would get, you know, I would, I would call mentorship and help with their studies, and it was the discipline, you know. And I think when we were uh, out in, at the court district in, in um, Brooklyn, talking with parents, I mean, talk with one parent, I should say, said that the discipline that they noticed that their child had was getting from J. Rodsey, they really valued that. They didn't feel like they had to worry about the kid getting into drugs or gangs. Well, one of the... Um Methods and one of the reasons for the JR is to see, of course, is to get recruitment. But the other is to win the hearts and minds of the kids, so they think and vote in the military. 
I mean, it's uh, subtle. And I've also met, you know, teachers who come out from our front of the school who so said to me, come on, this is the best thing for our kids. They've given up. They can't do anything else, yes, right? Yes. So it's it's right. a tough fight. But questions? Well, I just wanted to comment okay. on that real quick. But I mean, that the point is that it's important for kids, especially, you know, middle school kids, to be busy. You, you could be busy doing lots of things other than being in the military. And, you know, if you're in a really good music ensemble, that's going to provide you great discipline too. Or if you're in a, you know, playing a sport that you enjoy, there's lots of things you can do other than being in the military. Yeah. Well, if the schools could do provide right. for things, yeah, if, if we put our resources provide. into yeah, that. Right. Right. I have a right. question about the job issue because I know that that is what motivates a lot of the poor people. You know, who feel they can't not only go to college to get starts with not being able to afford to go to college to get training and then the job competition, etc. So, what is the? You said that you somewhere in your book you had something about alternative job. Um, opportunities or I don't know it just seems that concomitant with the movement to don't join the military there should be some kind of movement of jobs for young people I mean not just unpaid internships but um, whatever I mean because people are I mean, they're just this is what down. we hand out to the parents and students. It's options for life at the high school. So, and that's something that most counter recruitments do. When they okay. table, they provide information about different career opportunities, different job training options, um, college options, things like City Year, uh, AmeriCorps, etc. But given the state of the American economy uh, over the last 20, 30 years, that's one of the more difficult aspects of engaging in counter recruitment. The military can claim we will give you free college. They can claim we will train you in a skill that you're going to be able to have and you're going to go get a job. Um, while some people who are engaged in activism might be struggling to identify something that exists in a local community. So I think it is something that most groups do. Barbara's showing you what they do here. What the military won't tell you is that many of the skills and the jobs that people are trained for in the military lack a civilian counterpart. What they won't tell you is that the unemployment rate for different demographic groups in the military is much higher than those who are in the civilian labor force or not and are not veterans. They won't tell you about the high use of public assistance by military veterans. So. There's been some studies that have come out in the last few years showing that in the New York metropolitan area, food stamp use or SNAP use uh, among veterans is uh, much higher than among the civilian populations, which is one indication of the fact that unemployment's higher, that military veterans oftentimes come back and struggle for various reasons. But uh, you're pointing out a good, you know, uh, an important issue, some of the struggles in trying to counter this. Yes. I have one point, which is that if you if you look at the statistics of suicide among people who are on active duty as well as veterans, you see that that rate has continued to climb uh, since we got involved in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was all the way back to the Second World War, but it's gotten much more intense and difficult. Presently, if you were to look at the statistics, going back to 2003, approximately 260 veterans, these are not active duty soldiers, these are veterans, people who are already out, take their lives a year. So if you really start 260, that's a middle range figure. Of course, you know, you have people higher and, and lower. On active duty, it's probably a little bit higher, around 275. Uh, so yeah, this is an issue that when you talk to the young people, you should really bring this out. It's it's not, it's what John and everybody else on his panel said. It's not what happens to you only in the field when you're in the military, it's what happens after and how you cope or don't cope with that. Unemployment rates, problems with alcoholism, drug abuse, but the suicides are something like one veteran every day. That's a conservative estimate. That's conservative. Is that more Takes, so now than it used to be? Yes. Yeah. Takes his own life. It takes his own. Reasons that are given: moral injury. One is survivor guilt. You didn't help out the people in your squad. 
Okay, they got blown up by IED. <laughs> Next one, you didn't fire your weapon appropriately. You cut, your, your platoon took fire. A few people died on that. Uh, third reason that's given, you killed women and children. It was directed by your officer to shoot women and children. And they did. But you're in the military, you get an officer's order. You better not disobey it because they're going to lock you up with what level with it. It's that simple. And then finally, all of these concerns conflicting with people's values. Some people, believe it or not, go into the military believing that it's a peace corps with a gun. Yeah, just, yeah, that's an exaggerated statement, but we're not out there. The military is that the Navy finally pulled its advertising. Uh, the Navy, of course, for good. They finally pulled that. A carry a bomb group? What good does that do? Dropping 500 pound bombs on people, you know. So, I'll show up now. That's it. Yes. One is a comment, and the other is a question. Um, well, it's alarming to me because we have a Veterans Administration hospital in our small town too. Mm -hmm. Is is the the suicide rate was alarming enough? Mm -hmm. uh, but in talking to one of the counselors from the VA hospital, it was uh, even uh, uh, significantly alarming at how many uh, returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan go through the counseling session. It's, it was, uh, I didn't even think in our small town there were that many people coming town? back every week. What's your town? Uh, Prescott, Arizona. Oh. And so, um, yeah, I've got all kinds of problems. But the, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Sorry. Um, uh, they're, they're, so even those who are not committing suicide, they're just going to have to go through uh, counseling. It's, it's alarming. Then my question was, I saw on this list about AmeriCorps, and I've always wondered whether uh, AmeriCorps is a viable option uh, as an alternative to military service, whether they have uh, with the current funding to be able to uh, provide uh, uh, for a large number of uh, high school I think students. it's still alive and well. Yeah. And it's possibly probably a little difficult to get into. But the idea of these websites is to get started. Parents that I meet have no clue. They don't get to guidance counselors. English isn't their first language. If a, if a recruiter calls their home, which they, will, they, they freak out. I mean, they are so upset. Uh, what should I do? What should I do? The, the last thing they want to hear from is someone in the military. So this is a start. Uh, there are much bigger, if you go to know me, you're going to find out lots more resources. And you'll find it specifically in Arizona. This is specifically the New York. There was one that was more focused on Brooklyn. Um, each group puts their homes together. It's a start for the parents, and they really like it. And they said to their kids, let's go home and look at this. So, yeah. Check out Arizona. I just want to make yes. a quick, okay. quick response. Um, uh, yeah, with AmeriCorps, you'd think that guidance counselors would be sharing this information with students. But the reality is, some of you might know that the, uh, the workload for guidance counselors in high school is just so, so overwhelming. I like guess like most big school districts is 800 to 1, 700 to 1. About 400 to 500 to 1. And, and they, they also focus their resources on the college bound. So we talked to many young vets who doing our research told us that well, there was one I, I can remember quite clearly. He said that he didn't, when he was a senior, he never knew about financial aid for college. He didn't know about community colleges, but he did have a recruiter in his school in the lunchroom like every day. So that kind of is the message. Yeah, right. We have another question. Yeah. Um, what they don't tell people in the military is when these kids join, they, they give them a lot of bunch of bullshit that uh, when they sign a piece of paper that says they joined the military, they can just ignore it and just, if they don't want to show up, they don't have to show up. They don't explain to them, if you sign that piece of paper, you will own that. It's not a job, you can just leave or quit. That's one of the key tricks the recruiters play. They're like, sign this, but it doesn't really mean anything. If you sign that, you will own now. Their parents don't understand that, and one of the recruiters, I think he was like the highest rated recruiter, got most awards. He said that's the main trick that they give people. They sign something, they don't even know what they're signing. Right away, they, got, they should put it right in their face. And then the second thing is the School of the Americas. They changed the name because it almost got defunded, but they don't explain that part of the military job is the CIA, CIA works in the military. That's where they get a lot of their people. They don't explain about the drug war and this other stuff that. So my brother was in Vietnam. He worked with the CIA. 
because of Viet he was maybe part of Vietnam and he joined. Another part is he joined to get away from his family. His family was violent World War II nutcases. Mm. So there has to be people along with telling him not to join the military to say, come to and draw us if your family's dysfunctionary. Because that's where they get them too. They, if you get to them before the recruiters get to them, you have to maybe cut that half of the recruiters. I want you to just that. Especially if you get to them when they're younger, because I can't yeah. remember the stats. That's why my, basically why my brother's my The research shows that if you don't enlist in the military by the time you're... Well, if you haven't considered military service by the time you're 17, you're almost, you know, you're very unlikely to consider right. later on. Mm -hmm. And the Pentagon knows that, so there are now a lot of resources going into middle school programs mm -hmm. uh, and younger, so Which, military marketing. Heightens the need to get to kids and their families, their parents, earlier and earlier with alternative information. So at least they know about what are some other options and alternatives. Because like Barbara's suggesting, and others are talking about here, many families aren't aware of AmeriCorps. They don't know about the Peace Corps. They don't know about the city or et cetera. Um, and they, their kid comes home with some nice, shiny thing that a recruiter gave them and hardly fighting anything about it. Yeah, they don't know anything about signing a contract. Because yeah. I have had young people saying, say to me, um, well, I, I think I'll try it. If I don't like it, I'll quit. You know? So you don't quit. That's, That's dishonorable discharge. Right. But they don't, You're they signing don't up for it. But you can leave any time up until you walk in the door. I mean, your contract doesn't mean anything, I believe. No, that's the delay entry program. I'm really thinking of it. Is it mm -hmm. one story? Okay, one last question. Okay. Yeah, one last this, question. Yeah. I th a lot of uh, people join also because they're convinced that this is a good thing to do. That the U.S. Yeah. has to go yeah. to the Middle East and defeat groups like ISIS and behead people. Right. And so there's a whole ideological aspect that we you know, haven't really addressed. We didn't have time. But um, I think one of the points we need to make is that war is very, very profitable for some people. <laughs> for some people benefit tremendously from war. Uh, there's a guy, Nick Turris, who's written a book. Uh, he wrote a book about Vietnam, uh, shoot anything that kill anything that moves, but he's also written a book about Africa, about AFRICOM, uh, and the U.S. has dozens of bases in Africa already. It's a tremendously wealthy continent. It's trillions of dollars in, in natural resources, uh, huge millions of acres of land, a tremendous market, and someone's going to get that, right? It might be China, it might be the U.S. So they will convince people that there are reasons to go. You know, there's a group, a uh, terrorist group, Boko Haram or somebody, and you have to go and you have to protect people. And so there's that whole ideological component that we have to be, you know, yeah. acknowledge. Yeah, I think what our outreach is, is to tell the other side of the story as best we can and as early as we can to parents and students. And I like that concept that we have to get in there earlier and earlier so to become much more apparent. But that's our job, and our mission is to give them the other side, give them the literature, give them support, tell them what it's about. And it, you've done it all beautifully. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming.